said, well, my principle is I'm going to be pro-social, I'm going to be just. That's the principle I have. A, you know, you can have a vegan principle and you can you can live and die on that hill, right? But that's not a stoic hill to die on. to the Strong Stoic Podcast. I am your host, Brandon Tumblin. Today I have the privilege of talking with Kai Whiting. Kai has been on the podcast before. This is his second appearance. He is a, a lecturer on sustainability and stoicism. He has a book out. He co-authored a book with uh, Leonidas Constantakos called Being Better, Stoicism for a World Worth Living In. Today we tackle the very hard to discuss topic of uh, animals, humanity's relationship with animals. I hope you enjoy it. Hello, Kai. It's really great to see you, man. I'm excited to have you back. I'm excited to be back. I never thought I'd be back so soon, but we just had to, after our previous conversation, continue it. And I really wanted to deep, dig in deep to a really complex subject. So, yeah, we, I know we had a lot of hours in, on the phone about how to do this in a sensitive way, how to be respectful to the audience, to each other, to the fact that there's there's no necessarily right answers here like it's very context driven so is them anyway and yeah i, I would just want to point out to people that are listening we're going to try to argue from the stoic perspective so you can use a utilitarian argument but you'll just get me in an email saying that's utilitarian that doesn't mean that the stoic answer is correct or that we should follow stoicism in every single case there may be well may be reasons that other people might not want to uh, but we thought, Brandon and I, that we should look at from a stoic perspective uh, the role of animals in today's contemporary society and how we think about them and how we use them because we, we do use them for good or for bad. So we're going to discuss about uh, those terms. Uh, but yeah, so some of these, some of the content will get uncomfortable, I would say. So I would suggest if you are listening, put some headphones in if you have your kids around because it's not a subject. We're not going to say any negative, you know, swear words or anything like that, or certainly not my intention to do so. Uh, but the content is what I would call adult content. So that's my warning up to you. But yeah, this is an adult debate. Um, we haven't got everything clear, but that's why we're having this debate. We felt that this is how the action stoics learn by having a Socratic dialectic, by having it you know publicly they were public in their philosophy so yeah we're, we're welcoming you know any corrections or any thoughts that other people might have so it's great to be here brandon i'll let you let yeah you no throw us into the wing into no the wing. no that was a great that was a great little introduction and a, and a disclaimer there um i would say that i'm probably going to swear from time to time so <laughs> let's just set the stand okay, fair enough That's but your, uh, yeah. i do want to i do want to back up a little bit there. So just to give people a little bit more context, um, you were on you were on my podcast there a few, I think, eight, eight episodes ago or so. Uh, and we had a talk on, you know, your book. And as part of that, we talked a lot about stoicism. And we really what I think what I took away from it mostly is that we worked through a lot of uh, a lot of examples in the real world on how to actually critically think and how to use stoicism in very, very tricky situations. And I would say that as a consequence of that conversation, and uh, we, we didn't really particularly plan it, that's just sort of how the, how the episode went along. But as a part of that, we ended up dipping our toes into some, um, into a lot of, uh, let's say, potentially dangerous uh, areas. Uh, and one of, the, one of the ones was the one that we're going to cover today is animals, uh, our, our relationship with animals. And so when I say we, we dipped our toes, I, I literally mean that, like we, we brought it up ever so slightly and we didn't really go into a whole lot of depth into it but uh between myself and kai we we figured that it's it's it warranted its own full episode just on the topic and so we're going to really just talk about our relationship with animals and when i say our i mean humanity uh humanity as a whole and you know we're not trying to uh we're not trying to judge anyone for their choices we're, we're not trying to uh, you know, say that we know everything, uh, or, 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 you know, to, to really show you how to live, we're really just trying to have a have a dialogue here about sort of the, the general, just our relationship with animals and, and what we've noticed. And the reason why, because I mean, we've, 
it's, it's been like four minutes now, we're sort of uh, preparing people for this. The reason why we felt, I can't speak for Kai, but for myself, the reason I felt that this was so important that we actually give a proper disclaimer to this episode is because, uh, you know, I have a lot of topics that I talk about with, with friends, with family, with people I don't even know. And, uh, and a lot of those topics are, you know, hard to talk about. A lot of them are, are very difficult to talk about. However, the, the topic of animals and our relationship with animals, that one for me seems to elicit a more emotional response. It, it elicits more emotional response from people. Uh, and we can get into why that is, you know, throughout the episode there. But, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's definitely become evident to me that this is a really touchy subject. And so that's why, you know, myself and I think Kai as well, we wanted to really just set the stage here and say, we're not trying to judge anyone. We're trying to have a dialogue here. We might say some things that might make you feel uncomfortable. That's probably going to happen. It's probably normal. And on, on the other side, we might say things that, uh, you know, that, uh, that might come off a little wrong. And so you have to give us, give us a chance here to sort of, we're literally stumbling through this in, in many regards. And so, uh, and that's, I, I think that'll make for a good dialogue. Um, but so how do I hit there? Anything else you want to add before we go into it? No, I think that was good. I think we're ready to rumble. All right, let's rumble. Uh, so I think just to start off, uh, I'd like to go into a little bit, uh, sort of a broad, a broad statement here on sort of our general hypocrisy when it comes to animals and how we treat animals. And the, the first thing that I think a lot of people that, uh, that start to recognize this, one of the first examples they see is, is the example of, of pets. Right. So we have we have dogs and I know a lot of people. I mean, I had dogs growing up and I love dogs. Like when I see a dog on the street, I, I love to pet them and learn their name and meet them, so to speak. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm all for pets. But one of the things that that seems to be pretty obvious, but that we don't consciously think about a lot of the times is that we have a lot of animal, animals that are similar to dogs, yet we consume, we eat, you know, we put them in slaughter, we raise them, we put them in a slaughterhouse and we and we eat them. Uh, and one of the one of the most one of the biggest examples for me that that's really similar to a dog, maybe not in appearance, but certainly uh, in in general, is is uh, is a pig. And pigs are very intelligent. P pigs are very intelligent beings. In fact, most of them are more intelligent than uh, than than dogs. But just sort of uh, in a, in a broad sense, you you can imagine we have one animal, which we bring into our homes and we treat as family, and then we have another animal which we we call it food. So we have family and we have food. And those two animals are not that different. They're certainly not different to the extent that you would expect such an extreme difference in how we actually treat them. Uh, and so that's an obvious one that comes to mind for me. What do you think about sort of the general, just like the day to day things, the first things that, that people that, that, you know, that everyone knows about that might make you think, okay, well, th this is obviously some some form of hypocrisy in how we view animals. Well, yeah, I can think of a really good one that I found out about this week in preparation for this episode with the lower Wisconsin uh, region. They lifted the ban on hunting wolves because they were no longer on the, the highly threatened red list. Within one season, this season, just 2021, they had killed one third of the local population because it over hunted. There is very, very, very little difference between a dog and a wolf. So that's even more difficult for me to get my head around. Like, okay, so you killed one third of the population in one season because you oversubscribed the hunting list, right? I have to question like, so if people were doing that with dogs, as in domesticated dogs as opposed to a wild dog, there would be an outcry. It wouldn't just happen to squeak past the Guardian and into my inbox, right? So, I mean, I read widely various papers. That, that's the only one that I saw with, that picked up that story. Can we imagine if they went around shooting chihuahuas, how many people would be absolutely up in arms? And a wolf, to me, there is literally much more, is obviously more intelligent than the average chihuahua, right? But people would find that cruel and they would be really, really upset. And yet, because it's a wild animal, they'll say, oh, well, that's different. Right? So if it's a wild dog, even if it's a wild or feral dog, it's a domesticated one, we don't value them in the same way. And that says something about us more than it says about them. And they say that if you name a dog, it's more likely to live, right? It's more likely to be adopted than if you don't name a dog at all. But in terms of morally, I mean, it's very hard to say that certain animals are family just because we have to give them a name, because that, that, that makes them all difference. 
in this from the stoic perspective no i mean the name is completely arbitrary right our name we, we most of us didn't choose our names i mean some of us might have done as adults changed our name legally but it's something we most of us are born with and we had very little choice over so to just to make a, a moral judgment about what dog is worthy of being saved based on that it, it's, it's 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 strange to me that we can't even see it. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but we can't see that the distinction is quite arbitrary and quite strange. For pigs and as well, like they're a different, they're a completely different animal, but they're very intelligent. And I do know you have to give them toys in the slaughterhouse so they don't get bored. Because if they get bored, they start fighting and eating each other. And so that's something that most people don't know or don't want to think about. So I do find it very strange that we have rules uh, in the US and the UK, I'm not sure about Canada, but I'm assuming you also have them there, which protect cats and dogs and make it a criminal offense to, to maltreat them. But yet we have whole industry uh, <laughs> built on the need to slaughter unnecessarily, I, I think, a, a, the number of animals that we do. So the stoic wouldn't say like, you know, shouldn't eat meat, but I would question like your self-control if you feel the need to eat three times a day, for example, uh, a meat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, maybe we can extend on that because uh, really, really what we were talking about there was uh, was intelligence, right? So one of the things that when I'm having a dialogue with someone on this topic, I ask them and I, I genuinely ask, right? Like I'm not, I'm not trying to, to be a dick about it. I'm genuinely, trying to, I'm genuinely trying to see what they think about this. I ask them like, what's the difference between a pig and a dog, you know? And, and, you know, one of the things that they might say is, is intelligence. And sometimes you say, okay, well, actually pigs are a little bit more intelligent than, uh, than dogs. Um, uh, however, that's not even the right way to approach it in my sense. Like, although that's true in my way, in my experience, the way to approach it is, is intelligence the way that we value is that is intelligence, the way that we place value on a living creature. Because then you could say, okay, well, are we going to, can we take an, everyone take an IQ test and then the people with the lowest IQ in the world, they have less voting power or they have less, less moral authority or they, they have less freedom. It's like, would that be ethical? Most people would say no. And in fact, pigs, I think an adult pig is as intelligent as like a two-year-old child. And so then the argument is, be, is because, okay, well, let's think about this now. Is, is it, is a, uh, is, is, it an, is it a thing of intelligence that, that, that gives it the value or is it not? So is a, is a two-year-old less valuable because of the intelligence, uh, because, of the, because it's just as intelligent as a pig. And then when they get older, they increase in, uh, in, 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 hum, in human value. It's like, well, no, obviously that's not. So intelligence is a very interesting thing. And it's, very, it's a very tangly subject as well, because uh, I mean, it's, it, we can spiral out of control because it affects all kinds of industries and, 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 and general political uh, areas. And and you, you see that in the in the US with, you know, when, when Donald Trump got in and it was like, okay, well, Trump supporters aren't as smart and all this stuff. And it's like, okay, well, even if that's true, is that a reasonable argument for you to, to say that their vote doesn't matter? And so uh, I don't know if you have anything to add on that, but like, I feel like that's, that's, that's a common thing that I hear people in, in defense of eating animals. It's like, okay, they're not as intelligent as us. As us. And so they don't, uh, I mean, they wouldn't say it like this, but they don't deserve the, the right of life as much as we do. Yeah, I think that certainly there are challenges to having the intelligent argument because if you talk, if you take, it depends how you take it, because you, you could take the prototypical argument that the, the prototypical human adult has the capacity for greater intelligence than a pig, right? And you say, yes, okay, so, but that, and that's a value, right? So then you're not based, you're saying that because I, I value human intelligence. And they would say, well, I don't, but I don't value animal intelligence, right? Because they could say, I value only human intelligence. That's the intelligence I value. And say, okay, on what basis do you value human intelligence, right? Why is human intelligence more important, right? And then they have to come up with an argument as to why human intelligence is, is, is valued in a superior way to any other form of intelligence. But they can't get across, that doesn't defend the dog argument, the cat argument, because then you can't, you can't have a rule that says that dogs and cats are special based on their intelligence, because they are not the two most intelligent uh, creatures on the planet. Or we'd be having dolphins and whales as our pets, right? Because then you'd make that argument or perhaps potentially an octopus or something like that. So if you, it's not very logical 
to argue for intelligence and then have two animals that are not the most intelligent as your pets. Not the pet, the pet is not the issue, but having special rights because they are your pets. So it's, it then comes into we value things that belong to us, right? They belong to us. Well, okay, so some, some, a cat belongs to me, okay? And a cow belongs to somebody else. Does that give me the right to do whatever I want because it, it belongs to me? So it could be the case that I'm allowed to maltreat my cat, but you're not because the cat is my cat and it's not yours. But then, the, but then like, you're not allowed legally to maltreat your cat. Right, um, you are, I would say, allowed to maltreat your cow. So again, that argument falls down because then you'd make a rule where no one else can maltreat your cow or dog, but you can. Because then you could you could have the argument about farmers. You could say, well, farmers are entitled to maltreat their animal if they want to because they belong to them. But if Kai comes along and maltreats an animal on that farm, then that's wrong. But that's not what's actually happening. So again, it's incoherent because you're sitting there and saying. But that's not logic. That's not working logically. So it's not because cats and dogs are more intelligent. It's not because they belong to us that that we are allowed to, you know, that we value them and therefore we can do whatever we want. Because people, cows belong to people and they don't value them, or they value them not in themselves, but because of the meat or the milk or the fur or the leather they can provide. So then you start saying, okay, what do we value things for? And then you have the argument: Well, I value the dog because I want him to be part of my part of my family. They've got no economic bonus to having a dog in most people's cases. Okay, if you've got Husky, I, you can argue quite strongly with me that you do. So then I can say, so can, can we only, only dogs that have a financial you know, benefit to us, not that that necessarily is the right reason, but let's say we wanted that reason. So we should be allowed to keep Huskies. Yeah, and we should be allowed to keep guide dogs. Okay, and dog, dogs for the deaf. Yeah, we should be allowed to do that. A Chihuahua? So should, can we kill the Chihuahuas? And people would say, no, we can't kill chihuahuas. And then you're back to, then based on what? Because it's not based on economic fun function or utility. I'm not saying that it should be an argument, but you could make an argument that we value utility of an animal and therefore we, we protect them. But that's not the case for, for a chihuahua. I, I don't see much utility in terms of economics for a chihuahua. In fact, I would say there's probably a drain on financial resources. And for most people, they're not going to bring back their value uh, I can't see that they say, well, if I look after this chihuahua really well, I can sell it on eBay. I, I can't see any way that they could somehow justify an economic argument and then give chihuahuas and uh, cats, you know, certain cats rights. So that's also one of the things where we see that we apply a whole set of arguments, but don't apply them elsewhere. And none of that is coherent. And then you're like, as a stoic, we really need to be reasonable. And reason involves coherent logic. And Epictetus says that, you know, basically making a, a, an incorrect judgment about something is, is bad. That's the only thing you have in your control, right? The only thing I can control is my actions, my thoughts, and my attitude. Because in, in epistemology, the past doesn't really exist and future doesn't really exist. It's, they're, they're not concepts that exist right now, so they don't exist at all almost. So I, I'm aware of it. I can have a thought about the future but it's the thought that you know kind of exists as opposed to the future per se. So, you know, in Stoicism, you say, okay, the only thing that's in my control is my actions. So if I make a mistake in logic, that's just as bad, it's just as vicious as you know, setting fire to a city or setting fire to a stalk nest. That's what Epitides actually says. So you say, okay, so in Stoicism, there's an equality of errors. There's no error that is more uh, that is morally worse than any other. We don't have a scale. We don't have grades. There's no gradient, which is why we say you can you can drown one meter from or one foot from the shore, or you can drown 12 feet from the shore. It makes no moral difference. The fact that we're making the arguments logically mis mistaken, uh, we're mistaking our logic means that we're committing just as bad as error actually as when we are inappropriately killing animals. So in stories, there's, there's no there's no gray here. So it's like okay but your argument has to be logical and you haven't been able to provide me with a logical argument, right? So when people say, oh, well, here's a caveat, I'm like, because of your values, but what are your values tied to in that sense? And this brings me on to like, um, I was speaking to you earlier about the David Hume uh, fact value distinction, just because something is a fact doesn't mean we should value it. So people often say things like, well, if I, I am, should be allowed to eat animals because we've always, eaten animals. It's historically a fact that humankind has eaten animals since we've had records of humans eating, right? We know that for a fact. We know that our biological body 
has, you know, is designed or, or has evolved, depending on how you want to see it, to, to ingest a certain type of food, right? But then you have to have the argument, well, historically speaking, as far as, you know, we know that humans have walked on the planet, they've, they've been raping each other. You know, that's, unfortunately, that is also a fact. So if you argue that just because we've always done something, then I can then turn around and say, therefore, we should, we should decriminalize uh, certain acts, sexual acts to, of aggression, because that's something that is natural. And that's something we've always done. So why don't we continue? And then we can look back to not, you know, not the very distant past where people used to marry 14 year olds, right? We can all say like, you know, people married young. And so that's been what's been done because before we used to, we, the average age that we lived to was about 25. There was a different way that we calculated the average, but basically that was a lot of people died in, you know, a lot of people died in childbirth, a lot of people died before the age of five, and people didn't really see the issue of a 40 year old man marrying a 13 year old woman. She was a woman at the time, like legally, like they would be working, they wouldn't be seen as, they wouldn't be seen as being a child, teenager, the concept doesn't exist. So we've historically been doing that. Is that something that we want to do now? And people are like, oh my gosh, like, no, that's different. Well, you've just used that. We've historically always done something. So if you follow that logic through, then you have to justify a load of things like war. We've historically invaded countries. We've historically gone around walking with swords and we've historically never had telephones. So we should not have them, right? Because you say, well, what about telephone? There's no justification for having one. So if we're going to use that argument, we better walk around, better not have any cars, better not have any telephones. And like people, for example, say, oh, it's really natural for me to eat meat. We've always done it. And then they're spraying themselves with like anti, you know, anti-mosquito spray. I'm like, hang on a minute, you just said that it's natural and it's normal, it's part of the human condition to eat meat, but yet you have a, like a plug that kills mosquitoes and you have sprays to repel mosquitoes. Hang on a minute, if you're gonna have the natural argument, you're gonna take it all. You're gonna, you're gonna say, okay, I wanna be bitten by every mosquito that's flying around, every, well, it's only female mosquitoes, every female mosquito that flies around, I wanna get bitten because that's natural. And this is the problem there, it's like, well, you said that for one thing, but later, you're sitting there with your microwave, you're sitting there, you know, with your packaged food, you're sitting there with your spray, and nothing else that you do is natural at all. You're not running around uh, with, a, with a stick and a, and a flint to go and, like, kill an animal. You're going down to the supermarket and putting something in the microwave and then spraying your house with, you know, something that removes insects that you don't like. Or you've got something to kill cockroaches because you don't like them. Even though, historically, we've, we've lived near cockroaches for a lot for a lot of time or, or mice no one's like yeah we've always had mice in the pantry and then before we've always had a cat to remove the mice let's continue that tradition so again like if you go the whole logic of the historically we've always done something you end up in real with real big problems because you can't justify most things we can't justify this conversation because historically we've never done it right well i think there is a bit of a a bit of a pushback i'm gonna play i'm gonna play a devil's advocate here <clears throat> is that what we consume does impact our evolution in history. I actually follow a evolutionary biologist. I don't know if you know him, Brett Weinstein and his wife. Have, so they, they're, they're just a, a amazing people, but amazing scientists. And I learned a lot of evolution, uh, a lot about evolution from them. And obviously they're, the whole field is dedicated to sort of uh, observing uh, evolution and how it has made us. And so and I think there's another argument here to be made, which we can touch on later about the, the, the role of human ego in general in regards to how we treat animals, because we like to think that we come from, from God, that we've descended from God, rather than that we came from single celled organisms and became chimps and, and all the way up to what we are here. So we like to think that we came down as opposed to coming up. Uh, and we can talk about the human ego thing later, but from an evolutionary perspective, you know, the, de the, the, the devil's advocate argument would be there. Okay, well, if we've done it for so long, then that, that, that we are used to eating it in that way. I mean, you could easily argue that, for example, that uh, um, et, uh, animals that only eat plants, they are incapable of eating meat. And so you can say, okay, well, or, or let's go the other way, because it, it just it makes a bit more logical sense of the argument here. Uh, let's say a carnivore who is unable to actually digest properly plant foods. You, even if they were conscious, you couldn't make the argument that, okay, well, let's just put them on a plant-based diet and then, and then they'll be ethical. Um, now, you know, I, 
from my research and what I understand about human evolution, we, we actually ate plants for a lot longer. So I think what you mentioned there about sort of our bodies being designed for, uh, for meat, it's, it's, it's somewhat true in some ways, but it's not, the, the picture isn't entirely clear, at least from the research that I've done. And the, the other thing I would add is that, you know, it's not just, it's not just uh, sort of our digestive system. It's also like our teeth, you know, people always say about the carnivorous teeth, they say, well, we have carnivorous teeth, like, obviously, we must eat meat. It's like, well, have you ever actually seen carnivorous, uh, you know, a carnivorous animals, and you have, have you ever actually looked at their teeth. Uh, and so that's not a completely coherent argument either. But I suppose, really, what I'm coming to here to, to sort of challenge you on in that particular regard is, if, if we can prove if there is necessity, if we have sort of backed ourselves into a corner from an evolutionary perspective, is would it in that sense, be ethical to actually consume animal products? Oh, and the ethical argument is a different one again from the fact value distinction. So it doesn't matter what facts you throw at me. You can't you can't convert it into a value. There's this, there's no way of doing it. Like the, I, I've heard paleo people tell me a paleo diet followers, I should say, tell me, well, you know, we've looked at the graves of where people were buried and there's lots of bones. Yes, because fruit that was there has gone. They could have planted, they could have put flowers with them, but they're in the soil. You can't see them. The reason why you can see meat and you think there's a lot of meat is because bones stay in the soil. Like logically speaking, we have no reason to believe that they were meat heavy. It's just that's the only thing that was left. Like, it, in fact, we've got examples with Herculaneum. So where there was Pompeii and Herculaneum was where Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 um, AD or BC, um, or after the Common Era. So you, you're, you're sitting there saying like, what is it they actually ate? And we can take from their um, collagen fibers, we can actually know what they did eat. And some people eat, some people eat only fish in terms of their pescatarian. Some people eat meat and some people vegetarian. And we're talking about the middle classes, right? And Herculean and Pompeii are particularly middle class because of the way that Naples, the Bay of Naples brought wealth in because it was a port. So actually they've done studies based on the collagen analysis and they had a better diet, the, the from the remains that have been able to recover than people living at the Bay of Naples today. The average Roman was about five foot seven, right? People don't like, don't realize that like the male, oh, sorry, male, like to be in the army, you, you, sorry, to be in the Roman army, you have to be at least five foot seven. So let me correct that. And the average is higher than the average today in Naples. So we have this real sort of situation here where we go, well, the Romans must have been very short because historically their diet must have been really poor. And that's not the evidence that we have, at least from those two cities. I'm not going to say that every single Roman city, and they are, they are anomalies, they are not common because of the wealth distribution, but they definitely ate well. And some of them had, you know, definitely had money because we know where they were living because they, their body's there. So we know how big those dwellings are. And they are vegetarian. They're literally like Seneca. They chose to be vegetarian, right? So you can, can you say, okay, well, that's not 10,000 years ago, but that is 2,000 years ago. And we can see that people made an ethical choice based on potentially religion to do something or, or not to do something. So you can say, well, historically, like something happened and therefore, you know, we have epigenetics, for example, what you were talking about, that we, we've, maybe we've evolved and we can continue to eat it. Well, yeah, there's, there's nothing, I'm not saying that we shouldn't eat it, Right, because I've I've met someone who I was speaking to them and their son can't digest plants, so he eats meat and mushrooms, can't drink orange juice, can't do anything, and they were vegetarian, so they were very upset. Uh, and I was like, "How does the guy eat?" And they're like, "Like a lion, he eats once a day, he's completely lean, and he can't digest plant foods at all." I'm like, how is the guy alive? They're like, we don't know. <laughs> They're like, we don't know. So in that case, would it be ethical for me to tell him that he, he has to be vegetarian? No, of course not. And we're not making the argument that you should never eat meat. What we're arguing is like, are your reasons for eating meat valid? So if you tell me what well, there's nothing else to eat, I'm in the middle of a desert island, I either eat the pigeon or I don't and I die, then there's no ethical arguments to be even made because you say, well, what choice do I have? If I value continuing to live, again, it's not a fact, because the fact is if I don't eat the pigeon that's sitting on the, you know, on the cliff next to me, I'm going to die. That's a fact. But it doesn't tell me that I should or I shouldn't eat it. Do I value my life? Is my, is my life worth having to me? If I value my life, because it's a value, I can then derive a value from a value. I can say, because I value my life, 
I therefore think that killing this animal is the right thing to do because the alternative is I'm dead and that's not the right thing to do. That's not the correct thing for me to do because I want to preserve my life. But I've derived a value from a value. So if you said to me like, oh, I want to eat animals because I like the taste, right? Then we get into the difficulty that I said to you uh, previously, like what happens if someone uses that argument? Like I, you know, I want to have sex with an animal because I like the way that I ejaculate whilst you know, doing that. That's exactly the same sensation that's based on feeling, right? I'm valuing, pleasure. you're valuing the, the pleasure of the taste of your tongue. And I'm valuing, let's say I was, get, let's say it was oral sex. So I'm also valuing something on my tongue. So the, you've got meat on your tongue that's dead and I've got flesh on my tongue that's alive. So literally those things are happening in my mouth. One is perfectly morally acceptable from the general stance, right? Not a stoic stance. People would say, you eating a ham sandwich or let's say, let's say a beef sandwich because ham is a religious connotation. That's perfectly fine. But if you do this to the animal with your mouth, I'm not biting, but you do this to the animal, that's morally wrong. I'm like, well, why? The sensation that I'm having is on my tongue. So what is it that's wrong? Oh, it's the type of sensation you're having. What makes the type of sensation wrong? And then you have to argue with me that, you know, it's perfectly acceptable to chew and swallow, but not acceptable to suck, right? To use a very explicit verb to explain what I would be doing. And I don't see a very good argument to say it's okay to do one and not the other. But I can see an argument saying, well, you can't do that. You can't eat it, nor can you do this sexual act. If you talk about depravity, it's a religious terminology. So you could give me, you can give me a Christian argument, you can give me a Muslim argument, you can give me lots of religious arguments. If you say, well, I value my religion and therefore it's wrong, that's 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 a coherent logical argument, right? Based on your value. The Stoics will then ask you, how do you know that your religion is correct? How do you know that your God is well, correct? Well, yeah, I was gonna I'm gonna I was gonna push back on that a little bit because uh, I would argue that if you're just if you're adopting someone else's rules on what is ethical and what is not ethical then this is actually not a logical argument in the same way that if if you say you know if i were to say i believe that this is the way that we should all live and you ask me why and i can't tell you why because i have no logic behind it i i, I don't think that particularly holds up so it's like you said like you i don't know i know i cut you off and you were going to say that but basically the, the stoics would, would ask you to to question those values uh in, in religion and not necessarily use it as okay, well, it's my religion. Well, it's like, okay, why does your religion say that? Have you ever actually thought about it? Or are you just adopting this ideology uh, as, a, as, as a way to, uh, to reduce the, the complexity in your life? And, you know, I have compassion really? for that because, <laughs> because <laughs> life is unbelievably complex. Um, but at but the let same me push time, back on what you just said, though. Yep. Because you've just made it, because you, you've just forgotten something. We have religious claims in stoicism. Prove to me that virtue is the only good. Prove it. Give, give me some, give me a reason, logical reason as to why virtue is the only good. So I actually do have an argument for this and maybe you can pick it apart. My argument for why virtue is, is the ultimate good is because uh, we inherently have suffering in the world. Life is suffering, as the Buddha said, and I, I, I believe that's true. Fundamentally, we're all going to die. We're all going to get sick. So there's suffering and not only us, but people around us are going to die. There's going to be suffering. When you are born, you have to, you're going to suffer. That's it. Life is going to suffer. However, there's also unnecessary suffering in the world. So you have this core suffering that we can't do anything about, but we can create a lot more, right? We can sit here and I can insult you and you can insult me and we're causing suffering. So like we can, in fact, I think that the, the upper limit of, of suffering is, is, infinity like we can suffer as much as we want now i think that being virtuous reduces the unnecessary suffering in life and allows us to come to terms with the necessary suffering in life and so that's why i think because you could say okay well what's the opposite of virtue okay not 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 being virtuous do bad things well guess what all that does all that does is increase the unnecessary amount of suffering while keeping the necessary suffering, I, and I don't mean necessary as, as, in, as an you know, Epicurean, I mean, but you're using an Epicurean argument because you're telling me that I should, because you don't want to suffer, mm. therefore we should be virtuous. This is, this is actually an Epicurean argument. The Epicureans argued exactly what you're arguing. It's not a Stoic argument because the Stoics yeah. say it's indifferent. So if I'm an Epicurean, I would say the avoidance of pain and tranquil pleasure, so not pleasure for the sake of pleasure because that will cause me pain, is why I, why, what I should be going towards, right? Stoics saying, well, suffering is neither bad nor good. So why value suffering, 
right? So the claim that you've just made is putting suffering as the key point. And in Buddhism, you're, you're absolutely right that we should avoid suffering and unnecessary suffering. Stoics don't see it that way. What, why would we avoid unnecessary suffering? Why, why would we do that? It, it's an indifferent. Yeah, of course, it can be preferred or dispreferred depending on the context, but there's no logical reason from a Stoic perspective that we should value that more than the virtues per se. Well, I, I, it's, it's the virtues I, would, that go. I would say that it's, it's, it's matched it's tied in with justice, I would argue. And I know what you're saying. Like, I know what you're saying. There's things in life. Uh, and, and I would say that from the Epicurean standpoint, it's more of a, the necessary suffering, you know, the Stoics would say, okay, well, there's unnecessary, there's necessary suffering in life, we're going to die. And it's, and it's an indifferent, it's an indifferent, <clears throat> excuse me, it's indifferent in terms of our character and who we're going to be. But the Stoics would say that, that the Stoics obviously tremendously value justice. And I think one of the, the products of justice is in reducing the unnecessary suffering the maliciousness in the world but and so why, why, why value that why but why why because again you're using a value claim you're saying the most important thing in my life well not saying that you blame devil's advocate but you're saying your argument you're saying the most thing that i value in my life is to avoid causing other people unnecessary unnecessary suffering because it's unjust that's a value claim you can't tell me why should that why you should avoid that right there's nothing in stoicism that says that we should we should do it from a non non claim perspective. We say we should avoid unnecessary unnecessary suffering because lack of wisdom, lack of justice, right? It's vicious. It's 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 cowardly. It's unjust. It's ignorant, right? It's greedy, right? But that's still a, that's still a religious claim. The, the the problem is that we don't like using the word religious because we say, well, you know, if I claim that and I, you're calling it religious, now you're telling me that my values are just as as significant as say a Judeo-Christian or a Muslims, yeah, like <laughs> yes, of course it is because you your justification or one's justification for that. I can't justify why the virtues are the only good from a scientific point of view. My the Stoics didn't want to do that. They said if you don't believe that human happiness is the reason you should exist to like strive for, you should strive for human happiness. Stoicism cannot help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, 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 yep. If you tell me, like for example, oh, it's not human, it's not human flourishing, it's it's pleasure and lack of suffering, then I'd say go to the Epicurean camp because that's what they believe. They would act virtuously in order not to suffer, in order to be to have tranquil pleasure, right? And the Stoics said, no, that is the good. That's what we believe. But it's a value judgment. They're saying we believe that the absolute best human being is the person who is completely flourishing and completely at one with nature. That's our value, but right, it's not but, a fact. But through doing that, you are reducing your suffering. Well, and so it might not be a direct value, but it's, it's, it's a byproduct. I know we're going off topic here. No, of course, no, it's good. I'm not, I'm, I'm not suggesting by any stretch of imagination that understanding the difference between what's, what is in, up to, in your power and not in your power does reduce unnecessary suffering. That's not what we're arguing. We're just saying like, but you can't claim that your value is any more important or less important than a, than a Christian saying, I believe that Jesus died on the cross. Right. But right? I think, I think so. Okay. There's so a value then, judgment. So then let's, let's zoom out here and let's think about why generally you choose a particular thing. So let's, let's forget about stoicism. Let's forget about anything. Why do you adopt a certain uh, belief system? It's because you believe that it's going to make the world a better place. Is that a fair statement? Because you value it too. Because if you put believe in the definition, you're going to, if you, I believe this because I believe that. You just say, I, I have this belief system. I follow this set of beliefs because I value what they are trying to teach me. Or I, I value but, what they sell me is the consequence of following that structure. Right. Yes. So, yeah. But in, in, in other words, you value the world that, that the fundamental values are claiming to lead us towards correct right or you so, think you or you think you do right <laughs> right right right, right. You, you either do or you think you, yeah but you see, think you do but see i i would argue broadly speaking that is actual that is virtue well there's virtue in in, in the socratic dialectic because we're sitting here discussing why we believe that to be the case we're not taking particularly say a religious text or a secular text and saying because somebody else said that we believe that we're, we're doing like the reasoning game. Well, yeah, but yours is a religious claim. And that's fine. I have no issue with claiming that stoicism has 
principles that have no factual basis. But I've already said, we just be, even if it were a fact, it doesn't mean I should value it. Yeah, right? yeah, agree. The fact that I'm, yeah, the fact that I'm I'm white or I'm I'm a man or that I'm British, that's a that's a fact, right? piece of paper will tell you that somewhere but let's imagine we burn that piece of paper that I literally no longer have a British passport right that is also that and now what values do I have or now I'm not maybe I gave up my passport so yeah but your values are still British and that's why you act the way you are it doesn't mean that just because you have a passport doesn't make you particularly British you could have a British passport and never step to the country right it doesn't mean you have British values you could have Canadian values and and so, so on so I guess so just with, just with to that, so I was just going to say, just to circle back, I don't know if you wanted to add anything else to that. Um, we veered off a little track. I think that, that was really good, though. I like that. That was, a, that was a great back and forth. But I think we should get back on track because we talked so much about animals. But uh, So just to get back on track with animals there, then, what are the other... Uh, so we talked about you know a lot of things, intelligence and, and accepting uh, into the family. And what other do you think uh, in terms of um, hypocrisy that you that you generally see or what, what's the arguments I mean I, I've, I've had a lot of see the reason why and we know we didn't mention this maybe we should have but uh, I follow like a, a plant-based diet and I'm not I'm not like a it's not an ideology for me I used to call myself vegan because people understood it but I'm veering away from that now using more plant-based uh, I do eat fish sometimes I know you you try and reduce your meat as well um, and so you know we we are coming from that perspective and I suppose a part of being on that path you do tend to have this conversation with people because it gets it just gets brought up a lot and it's probably the least thing i want to talk about to be honest is is my uh, my plant-based my plant-based diet uh it's not a it's not a topic that i just i enjoy talking about but you know i have this discussion quite frequently and and for me the reason why i chose to do that is because i couldn't logically think of a reason to justify eating meat certainly eating meat three times a day like I, I couldn't, I couldn't actually come up with a, with a coherent argument. And so I tried the I tried the plant-based meals and I, and I liked it and it was good. And I think the only thing that really makes me uh, uh, sympathetic towards that in particular is the argument from a health perspective, right? Like I, I know people that, uh, that have, they've tried, uh, they went full on vegan for like seven years and then eventually they started getting boils on their skin. They ate ate a couple eggs and everything went away. And so now they just eat a couple of eggs. It's like, okay, that's, that's complete. Like that makes sense to me. And you hear these stories every now and then, you know, people have to reintroduce something. And I think there, there is an argument for that. And I think you were hint, you were getting at that right before we, we went into the, the, the stoic thing there. Um, so what, like, like, what, what do you think on that? What's like, where is the point where you would say uh, from a health perspective uh, that, okay, this is acceptable. And also, is that a generality? Because you could also argue humans in general need some form of animal products to actually be healthy. Now, I would say that uh, there's a lot of evidence that suggests otherwise. Um, but, you know, per, obviously, uh, perhaps that, that card is still on the table. But what, like, what's come to your mind here in terms of sort of the, 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 health, the health aspect, which a lot of people use, even, even if they're not ignorant of the truth, they would say, okay, well, I need it for my health. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, in my case, I, I only I eat meat. Uh, I think I said that before at my mum's and only on a Sunday because I value family, right? So I've decided that I will eat meat once every six months when I see them because I don't, if I go, I don't necessarily go on a Sunday. But if I'm there, I will eat it because that's that's a value. In terms of health, I eat. You know, I don't drink. Funnily enough, I don't drink. I don't eat ice cream anymore, and I love ice cream because, especially if it has. Well, I would say cows milk ice cream because now I don't have the enzyme lactase to digest the lactose and I actually get cramp in my stomach and it hurts a lot so I no longer am able to, to, to eat the ice cream that I actually like because I've just restricted my you know I restricted my milk intake because I thought well I, I don't really need it I do still eat eggs and, I, and that's why I'm very and it's not stoic to, to follow a diet to you know I'm vegan because and like 100% of the time because there are moments when you're going to need, you know, you might say, well, I value family. That's important to my circles of concern. And I don't want to cause a scene because it's not just for me to do that. It's not virtuous for me to just, you know, act in such a way that that alienates people when I don't have to. Right. And at the same time, like, uh, I, eat a, you know, you might say I eat a couple of eggs because one egg a week, 
it keeps me ticking over, I don't get any health problems. Like, so it's not about ticking a box, right? It's about being just to yourself and to others and to animals. So the thing is that I don't have an issue if somebody says to me, I eat beef once a week for health reasons because I value my health. Right? I don't think they mind if they say, I, I like, you know, I like the, the idea of the taste of my mouth. And I say, okay, but if you're going to be appalled by what I described earlier, then you need to evaluate that because you, you can't argue with somebody that they want to have, you know, intimate time with the animal and you want to eat them uh, based on feelings when you're so uh, opposed and you want to imprison people and you might say, oh, they're, you know, they're depraved or something like that. So it's like, well, hang on a minute. Like, there's no, the logic breaks down there. If you say for health reasons, like you couldn't justify to me, I need to have relationships with animals for health reasons. I, I don't think, in fact, I would suggest that your health would deteriorate and there would be particular diseases you'd be prone to that you wouldn't otherwise. So you can at least, you can at least say, I value my health. And for Stoics, all things, you know, all things considered, it is appropriate for you to, to uh, want to be healthy, right? The only time that you wouldn't want to be healthy is that it says something about your character. Because, for example, you might have to, you might say, "I have to murder three children, and I'd rather be unwell than and not eat properly and, and share my food than murder these three children." Right? But generally, generally speaking, health is something that is appropriate, right? Yeah, for, it's preferred. For it's a preferred and different. Yeah, in most contexts, right? Because I said, like, uh, like you have the odd context where where it wouldn't be because you'd say I can eat really well and my health can be optimum or I can share and save the kid lives of three children and I value those kids because I think it's just not to not to let them starve so that I my health is optimum right so yeah I, I can I completely understand the health argument but that's not we're not discussing that and I think there's because we're looking at not just should I eat it but also how should I rear the animal and how should I treat people who you know work in the industry when they were knowingly causing harm and unjustly to, to animals, because you can cause harm trying to save them, right? So it's not the harm that is the problem, it's the intent behind the harm, the reasons behind the harm, because surgery would harm an animal potentially, especially if you don't do it very well. But if you try it, you know, if your intent's there and it's, 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 you're doing it because it's the right thing to do, the appropriate thing to do, then the harm is, again, something that you say, well, it doesn't say much about my character. So if people said to me, I eat you know, one egg a week instead of one egg a day, then we wouldn't have so many hens in cages. In fact, we'd have hens running around because we wouldn't need to emphasize the efficiency of collecting battery caged hens eggs. We'd say, I'd prefer free range chickens egg and I want, because chickens will lay eggs regardless, right? They really will. I, but because I only eat one a week and my whole family eats one a week, she only has to lay one a day and we've got one, for, you know, everyone's got one in the family. You know, the problem is if we want lots of eggs and lots of cake with lots of egg in it, then that becomes more problematic because it's not, it's the quantities. And you say, well, how can I, if I value eating an egg a day or three eggs a day, how many eggs do we have a year? And what does that require if everybody else needs the same thing or most people want the same thing then you start getting the the lack of justice in the way that we treat animals and we say in stoicism we should live according to our nature well doesn't shouldn't that extend to how animals want to live according to their own nature mm -hmm. yep yep for sure um yeah i mean so just just to summarize i think like like you said there the 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 there, there is a case to be made from a health perspective. Now, what about from a culture perspective? Because the, here's another common argument I hear, and and I, I resonate with this in some regard that, and I think you resonated with it as well, because you mentioned, you know, when you go see your family, uh, you'll have a little piece of meat. And, uh, you know, it, fr from a culture perspective, we're so, obviously, our culture is sort of the sort of the masculine sort of our father it's, it's a representation of sort of what it gives birth to us in a, in, a, in a sense right our our culture and so we we tend to be so um it's almost like we're going home when we're embracing our culture and i see that a lot in in my in my friend groups that are uh that are let's say not canadian and they come from different areas and they they love to be surrounded by their own culture and they create their own culture and sort of that that's really important to most people most people sort of resonate with their with with where they come from and and part of that a huge part of that is the food they eat and, and the meals they consume um and so you know i think that there's again it's like what you said there and i want to clarify that as well it's like we're not saying never eat meat and never eat any animal products it's like what we're trying to do here is like challenge sort of your your logical inconsistencies and your, your the logical fallacies that you have in your mind and and really uh 
really, we don't, you know, we don't know all the answers to this either, but I, I do think from a cultural perspective, you know, and, and I experienced this as well, it's like, okay, um, if you have a, sp a particular meal that has some animal products, that's really deep and ingrained in your culture. And it's, it's a family thing. Um, I think that there's, you know, something that you have to weigh individually, but I think there's a, there's a, there's, there's some level of acceptance there where you, it might be appropriate for you to do it. Now, is it appropriate for you to do it every single day of the year? Maybe not. It's like what you said, you see your family once every six months. So it's like, okay, what am I going to do here? Am I going to create, uh, you know, create an argument in the family, ruin the dinner, ruin my weekend here, my week here with my family over, over this simple thing, or am I just going to, you know, have the meat and, and, and become a part of the, the, the family and the culture and let's enjoy each other's time there. So I, you know, I think there's an argument there. The question is at what point does it sort of tip into inappropriate? And that's, that's the it hard line to cross. It always depends on context, right? So, you know, I would say something like, I have not got so much control over somebody else's house. And I would say that if I reject the meat that my mum gives me, that's not, sending a, that's not sending a message to the supermarket, right? If I'm buying meat or choosing not to buy meat, I'm telling the supermarket that I, do no, I no longer want that meat and I'm not prepared to pay for it and I don't need you to stock it. But if it's in my house, I didn't buy it, and it's going to be eaten anyway. I don't really see that how making a stand against my, you know, my family is actually helpful in any way, shape or form. I don't see the justice there at all. Um, and actually, I can make them more aware about the, you know, the way we treat animals by explaining after having that meal and saying, well, Monday, I'm not going to do that. And they buy me vegetarian meals because and then have the discussion that we've just had. And they're going to be more, they're going to listen to me and with, with open ears, because they go, he's made a sacrifice for us. You know, he, he said that he values us more than being really sort of, I'm going to be vegan, come what may, right? That's my principle. So, well, my principle is I'm going to be pro-social, I'm going to be just. That's the principle I have. Is a, you know, you can have a vegan principle and you can, you can live and die on that hill, right? <laughs> but that's not a stoic hill to die on. Right? So, so again, it's, it's a value judgment. So well, I don't see the value of being vegan just because of being vegan. I recognize that the way that we treat animals is, is poor. And of course, that, that then impacts upon what I think about justice and how I think about self-control. Um, I think it'd be hard to, to say as a stoic, well, I can justify eating meet every single day, three times a day, because that's part of my culture. I think it'd be very hard to justify say, well, then you're just following cultural preferences without any consideration towards uh, justice or, or any, any, any function of virtue. Because if my argument was, I don't need to appease, as an adult, I don't need to appease my mum every single day, every single meal. I, I can make my choices. Yeah, Sunday happens to be a family meal. So it's common sense as well. It's like thinking, okay, what's the one meal that's really important? Is it Christmas dinner? Is it the Easter Sunday dinner? Is it, is it my mum's birthday bash? Like, is it, do I have to make a stance there? Is there not some, can I not be more intelligent about it? it there are many ways to, to, to think about how can I be the most appropriate person in that particular role? So I, I wouldn't cook a roast dinner here in my, you know, in my house for my parents, right? I would be like, well, no, because then I'm going to buy the meat and I, you know, when people come here, I say things like, please don't put me in the oven, right? If you want to eat me, by all means, like get a takeaway pizza and eat it on the, you know, eat it on the cardboard box. If you really want to eat it, I'll go out, I'll go out with you here, but I don't want meat products here. And I don't want uh, meat products here because it, it doesn't align with the values that I have. But I would never say to someone who's going to their house that they had, you know, they wouldn't be able to eat you know, what they wanted to. And I wouldn't demand they cook me vegetarian meal. I would say, look, if I come to yours, you're going to have to give me vegetarian meal. But if you're not comfortable doing that, that's fine. I'll eat before I get there and I'll have a coffee with you. So there's just ways of being kind and considerate. There's well, ways of, of building community. That's, that's what it is. Yeah. And no, that was great. And Seneca talks about that. I'm, I'm actually rereading a, a letter from a stoic there. And Seneca talks about, uh, uh, how we need to conform to society. And I think this, this overlaps with the Taoist idea that I really love as well, which is like, and what the, the same point that Seneca was making is that if you want to educate people and you want to change society as a whole, you have to become a part of it first. Like you can't come in and I mean, you can, but what is that? That's a dictatorship. That's a, you know, that's a regime change. But if you want to change something, you have to first become a part of the fabric of whatever that is. 
And I always give the example of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger because he, you know, he came from Austria and he came into the America. He barely spoke any English. He came into America. He learned the language. He adopted the values. He became, literally became part American. And it was only after that that he was actually able to move everything forward. And another uh, example I've used in the past is like uh, when you're save when you're saving someone, because you could argue that when you're when you're changing a society, in, in part you're saving it, you're you're moving it towards, uh, you know, uh, towards uh, the the greater good, so to speak. So if you have a lifeguard, what do you do? You you swim out. One arm is holding the person, and the other arm is stroking it forward. So one arm, half, is ingrained with what you're trying to save and the other arm is pushing you both forward and it's the same way and Seneca talked about that as well it's like it's exactly what you mentioned there it's like what's going to do more good so if you go in your family you say I'm not eating any meat whatsoever I'm done well guess what it's going to create a strife between between the family uh presumably you guys are still going to say stay family but it's very unlikely to to make them even consider uh reducing their meat Whereas if you go in and you say, listen, like, I understand that, uh, you know, I'm going to have, I'm going to have your meat on Sunday, mom, and then I'm going to make my own choices. I'm going to aim and reduce it. They're going to be more compassionate with you. They're going to say, okay, well, tell me, let's talk about this. It's less of a, you know, you shall not pass like Gandalf stand. It's not like, okay, this is the wall here. You know, I'm not going to cross it. It's like, no, you, 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 you're still sort of resonating with that family and still a part of that family. And only then, uh, because if you set a wall there, you're no longer really a part of it in some way. You know what I mean? You're, you're making a stand there. And so it's exactly like you said there, conform. And then, and then, and you, you will, uh, you, you will be able to influence them more over time. Certainly. I would just correct you because it's not like in this terrorism that it's more good because. It's yeah, I know. Right I know you're going to say that. <laughs> you're not going to do that. But it's like, it was, I would ask who, what is my role here? What's appropriate? Who am I? Right. I'm, I'm a son. I'm a brother. I'm whatever I am in that moment. What, what is in my control in this house? Like what, what, what corresponds to me? Is it my oven? No, it's not my oven. Is it my chair? No, it's not my chair. Is it my table? No, it's not my table. Did I buy the food? No, I didn't. So I have a choice at that moment. I can reject, I can reject the meal or I can, I can accept it. And if I accept it, is that unjust uh, towards the animal that basically that meat would have gone to somebody else's plate, literally on that table so it wouldn't it wouldn't have saved the animal in any way uh it's not sending any message to anybody because because uh, we can't have that conversation now because i've said you know you know gandalf i think that's great i've been a gandalf about it and with my own family because i can be gandalf with it with friends i can be like no I, I just don't do that i don't eat meat in anybody else's house really um because i feel like they I, I set it out and say, okay, because I never had that meal like for the last 20 odd years. It's like, well, we've been friends for three years. Like, that's fine. Like, I, I've never eaten with you before. So we don't, we just don't eat. We, we go out and have, you know, an MA together, but we don't eat together. And that's fine because that's not, I'm not creating, I'm not changing anything. I'm not saying I don't value somebody because we've never had that shared value in the first place, right? So I'm saying, and they might say to me, why are you, why do you do that? And say, well, you know, I might say, well, I'm vegetarian. I don't value the way that we treat animals. Okay. So if I, if I have a cow that I've looked after, would you eat that? Do you look after a cow? Yeah, I do. Okay. And someone did that to me in Spain. They looked up, they had a sheep, a lamb, and they looked after it and it was on the farm. And they, they, they were really happy the day I said, yeah, I'll eat a piece of lamb. If it's literally the lamb that's over there on, on the farm and you're telling me that next week you'll be prepared, I'll eat a piece. And I ate a piece and they literally danced around the room. And I thought that was really funny, right? Because they were like, we won. <laughs> so I was like, well, yeah, I guess you did if you see it. I don't see it that way, but yeah. But they were so happy because they said, they basically said the guy doesn't eat meat at all, but he's willing to eat. I literally ate that much. Like I'm talking about three centimeters here they were really, really happy. And they then spoke to me about being vegetarian because it, it wasn't like I was putting up a barrier. I was, I was putting them under my wing and showing them my perspective rather than pushing, pushing back unnecessarily because everyone else was going to eat that lamb. And that lamb I know was not being treated in any way, shape or form badly. I mean, I know that for a fact. So I was like, okay, how, what, can, what example can I bring to this, literally to this table? Uh, and we were discussing just, well, I think we should uh, just briefly discuss that. We were talking about Shape of Water, which won the Oscar. Uh, and that is an example of, you know, a, a mute woman 
having an intimate relationship with a with a some people call it monster, some people call it the asset, and some people call it like a, a an amphibian kind of human thing. <laughs> so we, you know, we say from one thing that we don't value it, and yet we don't seem to have a look at what does it mean when we have a film that, that is portraying that. This doesn't mean that obviously people think we the Oscar all the time for values that we don't like, uh, or make us to critically think about things. Because Parasite is one of my favorite films because it makes you think who's the parasite, who's the one who needs, who's the one is who needs uh, the others. Is it the wealthy or is it the poor? So I'm not suggesting that just because something won the Oscar that that we, we automatically think that's an excellent value. But it was just interesting to me that no one really sort of questioned that. No one sort of questioned the ethics of that. No one was suggesting that the, indivi the human individual involved should have gone to prison. That, that debate wasn't even being had. And I just thought that was really, really interesting that it wasn't even like all we were saying about Star Wars. Like no one's sitting there saying like, oh, you know, these people in Star Wars, I can't believe they're having interspecies relationships. And I, I, I find that fascinating because it tells us something about us that we can't, we switch off. We say, okay, that's perfectly fine in Star Wars. Uh, but they have, if, it's, if, it's, if, it's a, if it's a dolphin that's in the wild, that can escape, that can swim 20 miles an hour and is stronger than the human being, more powerful than the human being and will drown the human being and the human being in the world will never ever win the power struggle. That's completely wrong, that's immoral. Uh, that's terrible, even though I can't see for the life of me a lack of, you know, a lack, a lack of justice there, because you're like, the animal's free. If you didn't, it, the power struggle is the opposite. We're the weaker ones, right? People have such a, would have such an issue with that. And yet there's have been any thinking about, you know, watching Star Wars and never even considering the fact that things are, you know, are, are we portray interspecies relationships and we don't see a problem with that. So I think it's also interesting that we sometimes we say we have a certain value and yet our TV <laughs> yeah. says something completely different. Well, and I think uh, what, what you made me think of there when you were talking about that, there is it really gets down to what we choose to humanize. And this is going to circle right back because in Star Wars, you know, you'll see a, a human being dating, a, a, you know, a red chick with the big, uh, big ears and all this stuff. And it's like, why is that acceptable? Well, more or less, they're both humanoid and they're both humanoid and they speak the same language. It's like you're at, you're adding and they're, and they're wearing, they're both wearing very similar clothes. Like you're, you're, you're adding uh, the, you're, you're humanizing them. And we do the exact same thing with dogs. We give them, we give them uh, sweaters. We give them, we give them food. We give them a name. We bring them into our home and our families. And, you know, I don't think either of us are arguing that that's necessarily wrong. What we're arguing is, why is it okay to do that with dogs? Uh, yet it's okay to do all of the things that we do to uh, to animals that we consume, such as pigs and cows. Uh, you know where 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 is the line drawn, and 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 why are you drawing it? And that's that's really what we're getting at. Because I don't, you know, it's it 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 is what it is in that regards. And I think uh, just to sort of end off there, because we're getting we're getting we're over an hour here now. I'd like to end, if you wouldn't mind, on a talk about sustainability. And so this is an area that uh, you're actually quite knowledgeable on. Not that you're not knowledgeable about all the other stuff we talked about, <laughs> but, uh, but 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 you 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 uh, you are a sustainability engineer, so you 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 know you are um, uh, uh, qualified. Let's say qualified to to really really talk about this particular topic. And and, and uh, so in terms of sustainability, when it comes to animal products, because and you mentioned this in your book too uh, briefly, where. You know, if you wanted to go on a vegetarian diet for sustainability reasons, for the climate, for planet Earth, uh, you know, that, that would be a, a just pursuit. So what's what's the deal? What's the deal with uh, with with animal products and sustainability? So, first of all, you have to ask yourself, like, should, why do we value sustainability? Why? Why is it that we don't want, say, climate change to happen? They say, well, we value the fact that majority of the population lives very close to the coast and we think we value we value those cities in themselves we value the infrastructure we value the people that live there we value the cultural values that are, are you know spread from there so if that's the case so first of all we start with a value like what is our value do we value people on the coast do we yes okay we value the people of manhattan <laughs> they're valued now so okay do we want to save them yeah we want to save them. we don't want to make them move to the mountains if they don't want to okay we don't okay so therefore the sea level can't rise right because if the sea level rises we're going to have massive problems because we're not going to be able to inhabit those cities 
we can move, we can, we can move people, that's fine. Do we want to move people? I oh, know we don't want to move people. And other people who live in the mountains, they don't want these, they don't want the people there because we don't want the conflict that's going to happen. Okay, then we cannot allow the sea level to rise. Why is the sea level rising? Oh, because the, the global temperature is increasing. Why is the global temperature increasing? And people say, oh, well, you know, it's not, again, they'll argue with me all the time. Oh, it's natural that the, the temperature is different. Yes, it is, but we have 8 billion on the planet now. And when we last had this problem, quote, unquote, there wasn't 8 billion. So it was not a problem that they went into the mountains. But with 8 billion now, and the temperature increases, we've got a lot of people that will be displaced. And the acceleration of that difference is a lot faster than it was before, which is why we, we call it in, our, in my field, the Anthropocene, meaning we are now the main drivers of geological and uh, climatic change and not the other processes like I say wind or river. So okay we've said we have eight billion people, we want the cities because we value what they mean to us, we don't think it's particularly just or reasonable to move all these people to the mountains, it's complicated. We know that the temperature is increasing, why is it increasing? People will point to a few things, they'll say the way we travel. Okay, so we, we have to think about what fossil fuels we burn then. Is that the reissue about traveling? Yes, because most intense travel is through the combustion of, say, fuels. Those fuels create carbon dioxide. Okay, is, is, that, is that the big problem? That's one of the big problems. Okay, what's the other big problem? Oh, uh, the way that we produce uh, food. Okay, so what's the biggest problem? So people will say to me things like, oh, yeah, but, you know, so there's soya in the rainforest and that's bad and that has to be transported as well and so you're not really solving the problem like yeah but most soya is eaten by cows <laughs> like 70 percent of soya is eaten by cows so basically you have an inefficiency here because the cow will eat the soya and then i will eat the cow but i won't eat all the cow and the cow the conversion of the soya into cow isn't going to be the same so i can create more calories to feed the eight billion people if i don't have this machine as people would say, in the middle or animal in the middle, that, that's being inefficient with, with the produce. Okay, so you'll say I have to transport if I eat soya, but you're transporting the soya to the cow and the cow to the abattoir and the abattoir. And I, I've, I've skipped out the cow. So I'm just being, I've only got one set of transport, right? So you say, okay, is, is that what we want? Do, do we want a situation where we save the cities, we, we reduce the transport of, say, animals, because there's a lot of transport, a lot of the crops that we grow and all the transportation and the medicine that they need because of the numbers that we have. OK, we can we can we can we can reduce that. OK, also, if we if we have the methane problems from cows because they produce methane, which is more potent than carbon dioxide, then we need to reduce the number of cows that we that we have on the planet. Right. Do we want to do that? We say, well, yes, if we value the fact that we have these coastal cities and we don't want them to be submerged, then yeah, we need to reduce the amount of cows that we eat. People say, oh, does that mean that we should kill all the cows? And I'm like, well, we used to have human slavery to, uh, as an institution. We still have it. We have more slaves than we've ever had in terms of numbers. But as an institution, we used to have it. It was perfectly acceptable. I wouldn't say it's acceptable now for most people. We didn't go around killing all the slaves. <laughs> so it's like, well, you can eat the cow and just not replace it. Because how many cows are being born naturally? Like, is it because there's a mixture of a cow and a bull? Because last time I checked, there was a lot of artificial intimidation. And that's most cases, I would argue. And that's the other hypocrisy that we didn't mention, that if I, if I have, you know, if I do something to a cow for pleasure, then that's bad. But if I do exactly the same thing to produce another cow, that's perfectly fine. So I'm like, well, actually, these days, most animals don't copulate, in most livestock don't copulate naturally. It's literally an engineered thing. You're not going to let the average bull do what it wants to do. You're going to be very specific about the bull that you, that you enable to impregnate your herd. So it's absolutely ridiculous that people say, oh, well, should we just kill them? You know, just kill them. No, you eat them and you don't produce more. <laughs> like you just don't do that practice. You say, we don't want to do that because we value the cities. So I think in terms of sustainability, there's two things that I've done. One, I never learned to drive a car because I knew that would be a temptation and I didn't want to add to my carbon footprint in that way. And I, but I did travel, I used to travel a lot by air I used to do a lot of work in different countries. I think I've told you before, I lived in China, I lived in Latin America, I've lived in a lot of places. But, you know, I'm trying to think of a situation where I no longer travel extensively. So I've been in, like, been here in Portugal for six years and I hadn't done that for a long time. So that was one way that I looked at it, like how can I reduce my transport and how can I reduce the carbon that I create in terms of what I eat? And the easiest thing to do for anybody, more so than even transport, because sometimes you're going to get to your job, right? 
sometimes you've got to travel, is just decide what you choose to swallow and not. It's really the one of the easiest things that we can do. Tomorrow, we could all collectively decide that we were never going to eat meat again. And there's nothing to know. Well, they could force feed us. They literally could. But it would be very unsustainable for the small amount of people who have a vested interest to feed us animal products. We just said, no, we're just not doing it anymore. Where, and it wouldn't require, in my view, a massive infrastructural change, like it would say, we're not going to drive a car anymore. We're not doing cars anymore. We're going to go back to horses. That would be, that would be a whole different ballgame. But in terms of food, I can honestly say that majority of things just will continue to operate. We still have an in food sector. We still have packaging. We still have all those things. We just say that particular thing is something that we don't want. So I do think if we value sustainability and we value and we think that, that is linked to justice, which I would argue that it is, encourage self control and wisdom, then I don't think we have much justification for intensive meat eating, particularly from commercialized farms. So if everybody thinks of the poor farmer who has one or two cows, but in the majority of cases, like if you've done your research, you know that most people's meat doesn't come from the poor farmer that you're thinking about. It comes from massive uh, corp corporations that don't care about the animal, that don't call it by a name, that don't depend on that, and actually squeezing the local farmer out of existence. So I think a lot of cognitive right. dissonance also has to change. Yep, and uh, even the even the farms where the animals get treated the best, they still get slaughtered. So in either case, um, I think that's a great spot to end there, man. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for coming on twice, number two. So. <laughs> That was a <laughs> great conversation. I hope uh, I hope everyone took something from it. I hope uh, I don't hope you had an emotional response to it, but I'm sure you did. I don't know if I've cursed the whole episode, but uh, shit, there you, you go. Once, actually. That's why. Okay, now. there you go. Twice. All right, tally it up. Um, all right. So, where can people find you? You're on Twitter. I know a Kai Wedding. You're you're quite uh, active there on Twitter. Where else can people yeah. find you? And stoikai.com. And I'm very open to emails. And if anybody thinks that this was worthwhile, they'd like a different discussion about a specific topic, then we'd love to hear from you. If you're like, okay, how would you apply this to, I don't know, space exploration? At least we can talk about whether we can look at those things and how we can consider it. For sure. Yeah. All right, buddy. Thanks again for coming on. Thank you. Bye, everyone.